common sense. Because I've, I've talked about this with people for years. So you say, well, you can understand why the ancients wouldn't eat pig because they saw they were a dirty animal. The pig rolled in mud. The pig uh, ate uh, fecal matter. And, and they said it's, a, it's ugly, disgusting, blah, blah, blah. So they didn't eat the pig. Then there was no refrigeration. There was no preservation. And they probably saw that some people who ate pig, the heathens, would uh, would get sick and die of trichinosis. So they said, don't eat the pig. So you understand that one. That's commonsensical. But what about all the other animals? What sense does it make not to eat all of these other animals, whether it be a snake when you're starving to death, which, by the way, you can eat snake meat and live quite well on it. Why would that be in there? Who would have written that? Is that the word of God or is that the word of man? And so if it's only the word of man, then you what? The whole Bible is only the word of man? The ancient Israelites, you could argue, were simply trying to hoodwink the, the dummies in order to keep them under control because they were a proud people and a stiff-necked people and didn't listen to anybody. So he said, hey, man, I saw a bush burn over there, and God came down. He's going to punish you unless... You... And so he waved the rattle, and he scared everybody, and, and that's how the whole, the whole thing started. You could look at it that way if you want. I mean, I, you could say it's all shamanism. I... I'm not going to tell you what to think. I'm not here to convert you or sell you or tell you you're great or, or not great. To me, religion is just exactly that. It's what you believe in. It's your business, not mine. But take a look at what's going on the earth right now with radical Muslims who don't see the world that way. These fanatics would burn down every library on earth because they would take us back to the 8th century when they burnt the Alexandria Library when they invaded Egypt. And they burnt all the books in the Alexandria Library because to them... There was only one book on earth, and that was the Quran. So they wiped out all of the learning that had been advanced in Egypt. These are the dangerous winds that we are facing on the earth today. Some of us know it. Some of us don't know it. Educated Muslims know it better than you know it. You understand what I'm saying to you? Don't assume they don't know what threats there are. The king of Saudi Arabia knows it. He knows very well uh, he is threatened by these fanatics who would burn his kingdom to the ground if they could, which is why the kingdom of Saudi Arabia... Uh, right now, the leaders are shaking in their in their tents, praying to God that 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 Israel does the work that they should be doing against Iran. Savage. I'm reading the paper, the electronic paper, Italy's new dining experience, high security. Rome, diners are flocking to what can be called the most exclusive restaurant in Italy, one located inside a top security prison where the chefs and waiters are mafiosi, robbers and murderers. Serenaded by Bruno, a pianist doing life for murder, the clientele eat inside a deconsecrated chapel set behind the 60-foot high... Why would they deconsecrate a chapel? Anyway, set behind the 60-foot high walls, of the daunting 500-year-old Fortiza Medicia at Volterra near Pisa. Under the watchful eye of armed prison guards, a 20-strong team of chefs, kitchen hands, and waiters nightly serve 120 diners who all have undergone strict security checks. Tables are booked weeks in advance. Prison director Maria Grazia Giampicolo said the inmates have developed a flair for their cooking. Uh, he said, I feel whole cuisine in a place like this prepares the inmates for when they are eventually released. The guests enjoy their meals, and although the security seems at first very daunting, and imposing, they get over it quite quickly and forget about the guards. The mafia may be in charge, but there is no horse's head on this menu. Instead, a smart, mainly middle-aged crowd tucks into a vegetarian signature menu cooked up by head chef Edigio, Egidio, serving life for murder and competitively priced at $33. The restaurant opened two months ago and has proved so popular that Italy's prison department is thinking of trying it in other prisons. I got to laugh for a minute because this can only happen in Italy, where food is life. Now, if you went to a prison in America and you had the, the, the criminals in this country cooking, can you imagine what you want to be eating? Jello. You'd eat Jello and candy bars. That would be their idea of hot cuisine. It's not Italy. Securing a table is as tricky as getting past the sternest maitre d'. Diners are thoroughly vetted by the blah, blah, blah. But there's no danger of the meal being disrupted by the annoying chirrup of cell phones. You hear this? They have to be handed in. Oh, I'd love to eat in this joint. Along with handbags, and I, I would like to eat here. If, if only I could go to a restaurant where some idiot moron from hell didn't talk on a phone. Blah, 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 I'm so important. And yeah, 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 I'm going to Zurich. Yeah, I just got back from Atlanta. Yeah, I spoke to him. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. I feel like pouring coffee into their cell phone. 
Why do they let them even talk? It's one of the reasons I go to restaurants. I can't listen to people. I'm in a talk business. So when I'm through working, I don't want to. I don't want to listen to chatter. But most people have jobs where they can't talk. So what they do is they have a glass, a glass of wine already for six dollars. Blah 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 blah. blah. I shoot them out. I give them two glasses of wine. They don't shut up. Then you get hit with a bad perfume on top of it all that wafts over, and you got a double migraine, and there's no point in eating there. Give me this prison. It sounds like a good place to go. Handbag and the diners go through something. In the kitchen, Egidio, a burly 50-year-old from Toronto, and suddenly reigns over his team of six, chef, of six chefs. He screams, the pasta is boiling over. More salt, less garlic. Keep stirring the pasta sauce, he shouts. 17 years into his sentence, he is thinking of going into the restaurant business when they finally let him out. Like any Italian, I take my food very, very seriously. I like to be sure the diners are satisfied. And they don't just enjoy the food, but enjoy it with the same passion that I prepare it. He's in for a murder sentence. He's a prisoner in Italy. Maybe we could elect him to office here. He could form an entire sentence. Perhaps unsurprisingly, given his record, diners have been reluctant to criticize. Uh, he said, before this, I couldn't even fry an egg. But now here I am preparing five-course dinners, and I have not had any complaints. It could be because they know who he is. Yeah, it's delicious at these. Oh, I love it. Oh, yeah, it's great. Terrific. Yeah, tell him that his food's no good. Most of the dishes the restaurant serves are southern Italian staples from organized crime hotspots like Puglia, Sicily and Naples. Sommelier Santolo Matroni from Naples landed behind bars after getting into, quote, a spot of bother when he was younger, which earned him a 24-year sentence for murder. He, too, was hoping to use his new skills when he gets out in about seven years. He says, I'd like to think that when I get out of here, I can start a family, maybe get a job in a restaurant or hotel. Hey, you should come to America. You know, it's the kind of immigrant we need. The unique nature of the restaurant has imposed some restrictions. Guards watch over the inmates in the kitchens at all times. And the cutlery used as plastic as other plates, said Mr. Giampicolo. Yeah. The main thing is trust, and we trust the inmates to behave. If we didn't, we would not allow this to happen. Yeah, well, I'll tell you the subtext in a minute. Diners professed themselves delighted. When I heard about it, I thought it sounded fun, so we booked a table. And I have to say the food has been very good, said off-duty police officer, blah, blah, blah. The fact that the dishes are prepared by murderers, armed robbers, mafiosi, or terrorists doesn't really bother me, though I might be worried if someone had been convicted of poisoning. And that's it. Italy's new dining experience, high security. For years, I would go past, past Alcatraz Island, and I would think to myself, my God, what a great restaurant this would make here instead of a waste. Why don't they just let some restaurant guy open up Alcatraz, and you take a boat to it and eat there? In San Francisco, in fact, they could probably rent out the cells, you know, uh, and then they could be running the movie They Shoot Horses, don't they? It's a light. They play Bobby Darren. What else do we have for him, of him? Every night, I hope and this? It's not Bobby Darren. This is Bobby Darren? I, I don't like it. I, I'm not into it. Let me hear something that reminds me of a 57 Chevy, uh, two four-barrel carburetors, fins. Uh, give me, like, uh, I don't know. Give me Danny and the Juniors at the hop. All right, turn it off. We're having too much, too much good feelings here on the Savage Nation. I've got to get the angst going in order to keep the audience... Listening, I got to get them angry, I suppose. <laughs> but I may not be doing much more of it. I am so beyond anger. I am so beyond rage at the political machine. I am so beyond uh, wanting to change the Democrat or Republican parties that I could care less. I become apathetic at this point. I may change. Don't call me and tell me not to be apathetic. It's the greatest crime. All right, I understand that. I may continue to talk about uh, Phileo Sol and my dog for a while and the red brick buildings and how I can feel the, the semen in the brick. I mean, S-E-A-M-E-N, -E the semen in the brick. It was an area where the semen were uh, waylaid over the years. They'd go into their bars, get, get you know, knockout drops, drops next thing, and they'd be put on a ship somewhere. And I could feel this in this area, the Barbary Coast. You walk down these streets, it's filled with, like, Art galleries, antique stores, a lot of lawyers for some reason. Thankfully, most of them went out of business in the last year, and the buildings are, are vacant. <clears throat> but they were formerly like uh, little hotels for seamen and, you know, prostitutes, dance halls, that kind of thing here in San Francisco from the gold rush era. The buildings date to like, you know, Civil War, post-Civil War period. I've always liked, like even when I went to St. Louis, I'd go to the gas lamp district. If I went to Seattle 20 years ago, I'd always go to Old Town. I always liked Old Town. Old Town, Old Town. Whatever city I'm in, I go to the Old Town. Why is that? Like when I went to Quebec when I was a youngster, 
I used to love Quebec because of the the uh, feeling of the old city of old Quebec, the the paving stones, the Chateau Frontenac. I used to love shooting down that. Uh, what do they call that? Where you go in like a sled, a toboggan run they had at the hotel. Wow. You get a bottle of brandy, you drink half of it, and you get in the toboggan. Before you know it, it's you're sailing along and you're having fun. What do you want me to do? Politics, food, music, science, poetry, global warming, how to uh, care for children, vitamins, the care and feeding of children, as I say. Uh, well, anything you want me to talk about would be great. I think that the uh, the time for liberals and conservatives in this country to come together and defeat the Islamo-fascists before it's too late is really upon us. Unless the radical liberal comes to understand that his greatest enemy is not the conservative, but the Islamo-fascist who would stone him to death, cut his throat, this country is doomed because a house divided cannot stand. Now, I'm not the one to pull everyone together. It's impossible for me to do it. I wish I could. I wish I had the power. I wish I had the power to reach through those distorted lenses where the eye that alters alters all. There's no way to fix people who are so blinded with hatred. You can't fix them. I've met people who are blind with hatred, and they scare me. I've met people like that in my lifetime, particularly when I was younger. I'd get into situations that I couldn't get out of, and it was really frightening to get in those places. And to then extricate yourself from them is not easy. And I've been around people who have no reason. And I don't like people who have no reason. To me, that's... Uh, a form of human life that's that's a place I don't want to go to, okay? And I've touched on an awful lot in this show so far, and um, <clears throat> many of you probably didn't know where I was coming from when I said we're going to do books, but I told you that if we do something that's of interest to me, it will lead back and forth in and out of the news and current events anyway. It's all interrelated. I could read the Bible and show you how the Bible is related to what's going on in the world today. I can show you that in and out and out and in. But again, that's too obvious. That's too hucksterish. And so I'm not going to do it. I don't really want to do the hokum thing. You know, I'm not uh, Marjo. I'm not the Marjo of talk radio. Look up Marjo. It was a very funny movie in its day. You know, the revival tent guy. I, I don't want to do Marjo. You know, there are people in the, in the business who are very good Marjos. We can uh, talk. For, I wanted to hear from Faith. That's right. Like, if I were driving in a car somewhere in America, let's say I was the man who owned $25 billion worth of gold, and I hate Michael Savage, and I'm tuning in to see if he's putting me down again and wants me arrested. And all of a sudden, the guy's talking about fate and this and that. And he reads from the book where he said, nothing can stop fate, in other words. Was that true? Can nothing stop fate? How many times has fate turned people's fortunes around? People have thought that they were immune. Immune. Couldn't be touched. So I gave you an example, of a, a pedestrian example. In my family constellation, in my childhood's constellation of what fate has done. We're all touched by fate. Now, I myself, I again don't want to tempt fate, but I myself am not as believing in fate as much as I am in self-determination, truthfully. I truly believe in willpower altering fate. Let me put it to you that way, because if you start to believe that everything is, is, is fateful or predestined, well, you may as well, you know, just be a nothing, you know. You may as well just collect the old government check and eat the government cheese. You know, and press D, that's all, and scream about the rich, that they owe you something. I have seen in my own life that I had to put a lot of effort into things to, to, move, to, move, the, to move the earth. I don't want to give you the hokey thing, but when I was way down, no matter what I did, I was like a, I called myself, well, uh, there's so much I want to say. This has opened up so much in my own talking and thinking. I don't even know where to begin. I have recently recollected all of my journals. I'd lost them. I collected all of my writings going back to 1966. I've collected them. And they're all neatly assorted in various boxes. And I don't know whether I'm getting ready to do something or leave the earth. I really don't know why. I'm doing it all. I have a new assistant who broke into a storage shed for me and found them. I thought I had lost a lot of this. Every writing I've ever had that's significant, all my journals and whatnot. So I remember the early days of writing and how my life was altered by fate and by certain events. But I remember I had a friend who really never amounted to anything. I, I don't particularly like the guy. He's a backstabber. I won't mention him. But I remember him writing that life is like a, you're like a leaf in a stream, he wrote, when we were both trying to be writers. And we're nothing but a leaf in a stream, and we get caught up in the stream, and wherever the stream takes us, that's where we end up as a leaf. I, that never struck me as the way I wanted to look at my life. It is certainly true that no matter what you do sometimes, things are not going to work out the way you want them. Savage. 
This evening has been, been hoping that you so drop in. Very Now he's a true childhood story that I may 